November 5th, 1959. X-15 number two makes its third powered flight. There's a fire warning, and test pilot Scott Crossfield is forced to make an emergency landing. With the extra weight of unburned fuel and a hard emergency touchdown, the back of the X-15 breaks. Crossfield is okay. It's one of many close calls in an extraordinary program that will take man higher and faster than ever before. The Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum is the most visited museum in the world. Its collection contains some of the most important aircraft and spacecraft in history. Craft that were designed, built, and flown by men and women who have expanded the frontiers of flight. This is X-15 number one, the first in a series of three planes that conducted an extraordinarily successful test program from 1959 to 1968. The X-15 had two main objectives. It was designed to fly more than four times the speed of sound and climb so high that it would leave the atmosphere and enter space. The speed it would reach would generate enormously high temperatures, and the skin of all three planes in the series was made from a substance called Inconel X, able to withstand temperatures up to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Control surfaces would need to be enormously powerful. For flight outside the atmosphere, it had a set of reaction controls, using small jets to change the position of the plane out in space. When it was rolled out in late 1958, the X-15 was unlike anything ever built to fly. The idea of flying from the atmosphere out into space and back again wasn't new. In 1930s Germany, Dr. Eugene Sanger had proposed the idea of a rocket-powered bomber that was propelled into space and skipped on the atmosphere like a stone on a pond circling the Earth. But Scott Crossfield, who was a young test pilot in the early 1950s, has his own view on the early origin of the X-15 concept. I think that the X-15 originated on a fishing trip that I was on with Walt Williams. Uh, there are other people that think otherwise. But we were coming home from that fishing trip late at night, and two of our friends were asleep in the back seat, and they fired the 75,000-pound thrust Viking rocket at Santa Susana, and was announced on the radio. And of course, immediately our imagination was sparked. What could we do with a manned airplane with a 75,000 pound thrust engine? And literally, we calculated what it should do on the back of an envelope that I dug out of his glove compartment. Since 1947, the X-Planes program had pushed speeds higher and higher toward Mach 2 and beyond. It was uncharted territory, with disastrous consequences waiting if maximum care was not taken. Everything we did in the research airplane program was, was kind of on the ragged edge of, of new knowledge, uh, whether it be the configuration or the altitudes or the speeds and that sort of thing. That was the purpose of it, to learn or experience these things that we thought we knew professionally. On December 12, 1953, almost the 50th anniversary of the Wright brothers' first flight, Chuck Yeager set out to fly the X-1A beyond Mach 2. As his speed increased to Mach 2.3, he ran into a phenomenon called roll inertia coupling, in which forces produced at speed and altitude become too strong for a control system to counteract. The result was a violent combination tumble, roll, and spin. He blacked out, but he was able to recover after dropping 50,000 feet in less than 50 seconds. Down to 25,000. I don't know where I can get back to base or not. 
we knew it was directionally unstable at a speed below uh, what he planned to fly it. Uh, he thought he could handle it, and he couldn't. But it was no mystery that he might run into some kind of a stability problem because the wind tunnel data had shown it. And the X2, we definitely knew, was unstable above about 2.7 in Mach number. And they gave App, who'd never flown a rocket airplane before, a, a flight plan to fly in excess of Mach 3. Again, roll inertia coupling struck. At a speed over Mach 3 and an altitude of 60,000 feet, Captain Milburn Apt was subjected to alternating forces of plus and minus 6 Gs. Apt tried to regain control without success. He ejected, but was killed, and the plane destroyed. The X-15 was going to tackle much higher speeds and altitudes than either the X-1A or the X-2. Its control system would need to be powerful enough to overcome inertia coupling and whatever else lay in wait. So on the X-15, we decided that it would be inherently stable over the entire aerodynamic flight range, up to Mach 6, and that took that large vertical tail on the airplane. A typical X-15 altitude mission was planned to go like this. A B-52 carrying the X-15 would leave Edwards Air Force Base and fly to the top of what was known as X-15 high range at Wendover, Utah. The most sophisticated available electronics would monitor the X-15's ballistic trajectory. On return to the atmosphere, the X-15's outer skin would heat up particularly on the nose and the front edges of the wings and tail. The concept fascinated Scott Crossfield not just as a test pilot, but as an aeronautical engineer. I was determined that I was going to get involved in building and designing that airplane so that we no longer would have to have them all laid over cost and, and uh, under performance. That this was my personal goal, and so I left the NACA and went to work for North American. NACA had a major role in the development of the X-15. The Langley facility in Virginia was the major center of wind tunnel study and its highly sophisticated equipment was used to the limit by the X-15 project. The X-15 would be an enormous leap in design. North American could not make that leap in complete darkness. Materials had to be tested for their ability to withstand extreme temperatures. Very few would qualify. It wasn't enough to test the airflow over the X-15 alone. North America needed to know how to best mate it with the B-52 launch airplane, and the flight characteristics of the pre-launch and launch phases were thoroughly tested in the wind tunnel. The X-15 would attempt speeds about three times anything already achieved in the atmosphere. Langley's hypersonic tunnel was challenged to the limit. A large-scale radio control model was used for drop tests in natural air conditions. It was carried up in a helicopter. When the model was dropped, its controlled descent was monitored and analyzed. But flying qualities were not the only problem. Major problem number one was to develop a throttleable rocket engine so we didn't have just a one-shot missile kind of an operation. With the other airplanes, we had four barrels, so we at least had four steps in thrust. The engine plan for the X-15 was the XLR-99 from the Reaction Motors Division of Thiokol. It was a development of the Viking rocket engine Scott Crossfield had been inspired by on his fishing trip. It would produce 57,000 pounds of thrust and be fully throttleable. Making an engine that big uh, that could be throttled was something that hadn't really been done for before. Uh, when you throttle an engine that is cooled by the fuel,